on October 10th, 1955. This issue of Life magazine was in newsstands all across the United States and available for purchase. In it, there was an in-memoriam tribute to the life of Emmett Till. Not many would debate anything that was said about Emmett. After all, he was just a child. And most people would agree that a 14-year-old boy should not have died in the brutal way that he did. But it was what Life magazine printed about Emmett Till's father, Louis Till, that a lot of people took issue with. For just a moment, it seemed like there was going to be a second civil war, and all over something that both sides agreed had nothing to do with the case of Emmett Till. Before everything died down, information would come out from the War Department, and a totally different set of information would come out from the friends of Lewis Till. And the information from Emmett Till's mother was only a source of more confusion. All of it was leaving the American public with this question. Was Lewis Till a war hero who was killed in action? Or was he a disgraced soldier who was executed for rape and murder? Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous stories from yesteryear that make Ty's Hot Mess History Channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream. And comment, I subscribed, in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. In the midst of the Emmett Till trial, a lot of stories came out about a lot of people who were involved. Some stories were even uncovered about people who were really not involved in the case at all. Just to give a very brief account of what had occurred in the matter so that we can catch up to October of 1955, I'll lay out a bare bones timeline, then continue with the story of Lewis Till. August 21st, 1955. 14-year-old Emmett Till arrives in Mississippi to visit family. August 24th, reportedly, Emmett whistles at a white woman outside of a store. Whether or not he actually did this is debatable. But even if he did, I think that most people agree that what happened next should not have. August 28th, Emmett is kidnapped at gunpoint from his relative's home. August 31st, Emmett's horribly beaten and decomposed body is found in the Tallahatchie River. September 3rd, Emmett Till's open casket funeral is held in Chicago. September 6th, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant are indicted on murder and kidnapping charges. September 19th, trial begins. September 23rd, Jury renders not guilty verdict after 67 minutes of deliberation. September 30th, Milam and Bryant are released on bond with kidnapping charges still pending. That brings us close enough to where we can begin our story. After the not guilty verdict was rendered, there was an outcry from all over the nation and the world about the miscarriage of justice that had occurred in Sumner, Mississippi. Well, the outcry came from many parts of the nation, but not a lot of places in the South, especially not Mississippi. A number of periodicals printed stories condemning America's judicial system and paying tribute to the life of Emmett Till. One of those many publications was Life magazine. In its October 10th issue, it read, in part, these words, quote, Men can be forgiven for prejudice as a sign of ignorance or imperfect understanding of their religion. No religious man can condone a brutal murder. Those in Sumner and elsewhere who do condone it are in far worse danger than Emmett Till ever was. He had only his life to lose. And many others have done that, including his soldier father who was killed in France fighting for the American proposition that all men are equal. End quote. While no one seemed to take issue with the kind words being said about Emmett, his father was a completely different story. 
This notion that Lewis Till was a wartime hero did not sit well with Mississippi Senator James O. Eastland because he was in possession of information that told a quite different story, and he leaked that information to the press. Yes, Lewis Till had served in the army. We'll get to how he got there later. And yes, he did serve during World War II, but according to Life magazine, he died in France. Well, according to the information that Senator Eastland leaked, which came from the War Department, Lewis Till died in Italy. Not too big of a deal. But, according to Life, he was killed in battle. According to the U.S. War Department, he was hanged for raping two Italian women and murdering another one. And that would be his official legacy. After the fluff pieces had been circulated about the fallen war hero, Louis Till, U.S. Army officials did confirm that Private Louis Till of the 177th Port Company served in occupied Italy during World War II and that he was executed there on July 2nd, 1945, at the age of 24, for rape and murder. So, the army had executed him 10 years before Emmett Till's death, which was just weeks shy of Emmett Till's fourth birthday. At the time of revealing the information, the War Department could not confirm that Lewis Till was the same Lewis Till who was the father of Emmett Till, but it was him. It was quite easy for reporters to connect the dots. His pre-induction address was in the same town as Mamie Till's, Argo, Illinois. He had been ordered to pay military spousal support to Mamie Till, and she received the telegram regarding her husband's death that was the same date of death as the Till mentioned in the Army's report. Till's execution was a hanging by Army authorities. Armed with this information, News outlets all over Mississippi and other parts of the South made it their point to destroy the narrative that Lewis Till was any kind of hero. It was the Northern newspapers versus the Southern ones. And even though both sides agreed that the information about Lewis Till was irrelevant to the trial of Emmett Till's killers, the news outlets in the South took this as an opportunity to call out the publications in the North for spreading lies. It was written that the Life magazine editorial was, quote, typical of the unfounded statements in some northern newspapers. Multiple Mississippi newspapers wrote some version of this set of information. The Sun-Herald tried its best, but it seems that there was no proofreader at work that day, with them referring to Life magazine as Like magazine, and also calling the article about Emmett Till an eh, editorial instead of an editorial. Some of the newspapers that ran the story a day or two later had a little more information. The records held by the Department of Defense revealed that in the town of Civita Vecchia, Louis Till raped two Italian women and shot to death another one, all in the same day. The Defense Department's indictment records contained the names of the victims. Anna Zanchi was the shooting victim, and Benny Lucrezzi and Frieda Mari were his rape victims. Just for the record, a few of the Mississippi newspapers like the Delta Democrat Times reversed the story, saying that Lewis Till killed two women and raped one. The Lewis Till headlines dominated Mississippi newspapers for a little over a week after Life ran its editorial. Even though both sides seemed to agree that Lewis Till's information had no bearing on the pending kidnapping charges for Milam and Bryant, both sides still reported on him, both sides being the North and the South. The South, and particularly Mississippi, saw this evidence against Lewis Till as a win for them, because in their minds, it proved that Northern publications were making up stories to sway public opinion. And it also proved that the NAACP had too much influence on the news that came from the North. The Mississippi press wanted to convey the message that the state was not dismissive of Emmett Till's murder, and that the jury would have reached a guilty verdict on the murder had they been presented with better evidence. Well, that's what they wrote. But I don't think that anyone really believed it. After all, 
There were reports about laughter coming from the jury deliberation room as they took only 67 minutes to find Milam and Bryant not guilty of murder. And then there was the one juror who infamously told a reporter that they wouldn't have taken so long if they hadn't stopped to drink pop. So yeah, the general thought was that Mississippi did not take Emmett Till's case seriously at all. But the backlash from the Mississippi newspapers did cause Life magazine to print a retraction about Lewis Till in their October 31st issue in their letters to the editors section. Well, that is what the United States Army and Mississippi media had to say about Lewis Till. But what about his friends? They talked to Jet Magazine, one of the few Black-owned publications at the time. The week of October 27th, Jet ran the story about Lewis Till's execution for his crimes in Italy. The following week, in their November 3rd issue, Jet had quotes from anonymous former soldiers who said that they served with Lewis Till. Here's what they said about him. One who Jet only described as another Negro non-com said, quote, Till never confessed the crime, and we felt he was innocent. It is inconceivable that the big, playful fellow could be a criminal. If the facts stood up, the army should not have been so hush-hush about killing him, end quote. Another friend said of him, quote, He was a fun lover and always into mischief, but nothing serious. End quote. And the last quote in the short story is from a man who Jet only calls another former war buddy. And he said, quote, He was a sentimental guy, always thinking of his wife and baby. End quote. Well, speaking of that wife and baby, what did his wife have to say about Lewis Till? After the stories came out in the Mississippi newspapers that were in stark contrast to Life magazine's heroic depiction of Lewis Till, Mamie Till, his wife and Emmett's mother, revealed that she did in fact receive a telegram from the army informing her of her husband's death on July 2, 1945. She said that the correspondence only revealed that he was executed for willful misconduct but she was never given any further details. She never knew what the misconduct was. She said that she tried to find out by writing letters. She wrote to Till's commanding officer, as well as the chaplain, and even the president of the United States himself, Franklin Roosevelt. But there is a problem with this timeline. Again, Lewis Till died on July 2nd, 1945. Well, President Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945, roughly three months before her husband died. So it is highly unlikely that she wrote to him posthumously. The amazing thing is that the Southern papers didn't beat her up too badly about this point. She certainly had more than enough on her mind, dealing with her son's death, and at this point, the fact that the killers had been found innocent of murder and that the only thing that she could hope for was a guilty verdict on kidnapping charges. Now, that was pretty much all that she said about Lewis Till in 1955, but it's what she wrote about him years later in her book called Death of Innocence that is eyebrow-raising and disturbing. One of the very first things that she mentioned about her husband was that after Emmett was born, there was a woman in the neighborhood who had a child the same age as Emmett. Mamie didn't really have the hang of breastfeeding, and this neighbor asked permission to feed Emmett from her breast. Mamie reluctantly allowed her to, and it went well. And for the first time, Emmett slept through the night. Very shortly after that, she came to find out that Lewis Till was having a sexual affair with that same neighbor. She also said that Lewis drank very heavily and gambled a lot, almost every day on his way home. So she got used to his coming home late and coming home angry when he lost, which was often, and sometimes even gambling away their money for rent. And when he was angry, he would get physically violent with her. 
She wrote about one night in particular that Lewis came home after a losing night of gambling and told her not to eat the food that she was getting ready to put into her mouth. When she ate the bite that was already on her fork, he pounced on her, as she described it, and took her to the floor and choked her until the food came back up. He continued to squeeze her neck until she blacked out. When she came to, she boiled water and waited for him in the dark. When he returned, she threw the boiling water on him and he ran to get help. Oddly enough, he got that help from Mamie's mother, who lived down the street. She called the police, and they didn't arrest him that time, but many more incidents would follow. On that particular night, they felt that he had enough punishment from the boiling water that took off some of his skin. Their situation got so bad that Mamie ended up having to file for a restraining order against her husband, which she was granted and which he violated over and over and over again. On the last occasion that Mamie took Lewis to court, the judge had had enough and told Lewis that he had to go somewhere. He gave him the option of jail or the army. And that is how Lewis Till got in the army. So there is a chance that when Mamie Till got that telegram, letting her know that Lewis Till was dead, she might have been letting out a sigh of relief or maybe even rejoicing. Maybe she never followed up with anyone to find out the specific details. Maybe she did. But one thing that she wrote in her book was that when she read the words willful misconduct in his death notification telegram, she thought that the words fit Lewis Till perfectly. Do you know who else had a habit of putting his hands on women? James Brown. I published a video about what he did to Tammy Terrell, according to her sister. You can see it here. My sources for this story are Death of Innocence by Mamie Till Mobley and Christopher Benson, Life Magazine Archives 1955, The Greenwood Commonwealth Archives 1955, Clarion Ledger Archives 1955, The Delta Democrat Times Archives 1955, and Jet Magazine Archives, 1955. Are you a content creator, influencer, or blogger who feels like your platform could use an extra boost? Are you thinking about becoming a content creator but you don't know where to start and you want to be sure that you dot all of your I's and cross all of your T's? If so, Layla Lynn can likely show you exactly what you need to get on your way. Her fun new class is called The Business of Blogging with Layla Lynn and in it, she is sharing the fundamental principles of blogging in 2022. Because let's face it, social media is a moving target, and what worked well five years ago is likely not what works well today. And with Layla Lynn, you're getting the information from someone who is successful at putting the principles to practice on her own social media platforms, and she literally has the credentials to back it all up, as she holds degrees in social media marketing. Layla Lynn is a multiple six-figure earner whose first social media marketing course helped this channel go from earning $30 a month to earning five figures a month. I'm ready to dig in my heels and learn even more so that I can earn even more. Are you with me? If so, hit my link at the top of the description box and join her class to access this amazing, affordable advice from a woman who knows her business, the business of blogging. If you want text notifications so that you can get a text a few minutes before I release a new video or before I live stream, text me at 310-634-0865 to let me know, or you can hit my link that's in the description box. If you have a business, product, service, YouTube channel, or social media account that you would like to promote on my channel, email me at taiwan at taisaidwhattaisaid.com 
to get rates for advertising on my community tab, my live streams, and or my edited videos, just like this one.